Existentialism. Noun. A philosophical theory that analyzes the existence of the individual person as a free and responsible agent, determining their own development through acts of will. It's a concept that's only grown more prominent as our world and connections with those around us has evolved into the 21st century, with no shift being as monumental as the advent of the internet age. Allison, can you explain what internet is? <laughs> the late 2000s and early 2010s was a monumental era for internet culture, a time when the idea of the World Wide Web becoming hyper-integrated within our social lives was finally starting to take shape. And yet, its form remained ambiguous. There was still a certain, ever-lingering level of Wild Westism when it came to the web. This still kind of felt like uncharted territory, like something was brewing in the collective subconscious of our connected world, something that wasn't very easy to put into words. The year is 2012, and Donald Glover is captivated by these concepts. After a sudden rise to notoriety through his contributions to 30 Rock and the skit group Derek Comedy, Donald was thrust in the mainstream with his huge role in the now classic TV comedy Community, as well as an array of viral stand-up routines and rap songs. It was a newfound fame that we hadn't really seen form like this before, and Donald was a very different kind of celebrity, one that could indicate the future of the entertainment industry and how it crafted its content. It's a position that carries a lot of weight, and it makes sense that Donald eventually found himself questioning his public persona. After his departure from Community, Donald took a step back from the spotlight and recalibrated his artistic image, specifically his music career under the stage name Childish Gambino. From a series of personal notes posted to his Instagram to his budding interest in philosophy, Donald Glover was changing, an internal metamorphosis that just so happened to be coinciding with that previously mentioned technological one. It was a perfect storm that led to what I believe is one of the most interesting artistic expressions of the 2010s, Because the Internet by Childish Gambino, a project that, as a whole, not only serves as a fascinating fusion of mediums and media, but also a one-of-a-kind meditation on our existence and connection with others amongst our ever-changing technological landscape. Oh yeah, the, the music's pretty good, too. So, what is Because the Internet? Well, if you're familiar with the world of online hip-hop music discourse, I'm sorry for your loss. But you probably know of it as just Childish Gambino's sophomore record. And it's not just any second studio effort. It's a Grammy-nominated and commercially successful pop rap epic, one that divided critics pretty strongly upon its release with its 19 tracks of decidedly different hip-hop tunes. Before we go any further though, I want to make something clear. I'm not the biggest Childish Gambino stand in the world, far from it. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Camp is a good album by any capacity. But holy shit, the globe Donald had from Camp and his earlier mixtapes to this is unbelievable. Abandoning a lot of the corny wordplay, odd production choices, and over-reliance on cringy punchlines that infested Camp did wonders for BTI, as Glover sounds focused and on point across the album's vast soundscape. Because the internet is just this roller coaster of sounds and moods that almost feels as breakneck as the internet itself. You feel yourself whizzing past these digital locales and pockets of humanity in harrowing fashion, all of them painted wonderfully by great production and theatrics. I mean, it's not exactly easy to stitch a sonic palette of World Star, Telegraph Avenue, Zealots of Stockholm, and Sweatpants together into a cohesive project, but it still manages to work here. I'll touch more on this later, but one of the best things about BTI is just how well it's aged. In the near decade since it's released, this album really hasn't lost its edge, with the vast array of varying samples and wide palette of instrumentation creating a timeless sound that certainly doesn't sound like other mainstream pop rap records from 2013. Despite how clearly rooted BTI is in the early 2010s internet, it doesn't define itself by its contemporary trends in hip hop. But it's the substance, the lyrical and thematic content that acts as the spark for Because the Internet's multimedia universe. Like I mentioned earlier, the BTI album is this whirlwind of ideas and storylines, this spliced together, incoherent timeline that Gambino's character, simply known here as The Boy, navigates through, narrating the plethora of interactions he has with others, both in reality and virtually. From the drug dealing relationship the boy finds himself stuck in on pink toes to the panic attack he has on the party, this new childish Gambino persona serves not just to offer commentary on internet culture, but also to personify someone whose relationship with it is almost inseparable from their own identity, and the realization of such leads to a total internal crisis. 
It's pretty clear as because the internet progresses that the boy thinks pretty highly of himself, seeing himself as this intelligent, attractive, almost transcendent individual, watching over the world from his upper class environment and digital lens. He's a character that, as his life ebbs and flows through this hodgepodge of strange scenarios, his own understanding of himself and his existence evolves, leading to the album's explosive, climactic outro, Life the Biggest Troll. With that haunting digital jingle sample reverberating in the song's instrumental, Glover connects the boy's journey back to the childish Gambino persona, along with leaving us some parting conclusions and takeaways from the boy from a more allegorical standpoint. It's a wonderful ribbon on this home run Christmas present of an album. Like, I'm talking PlayStation 2 with a copy of San Andreas here. It's that great. My only complaint is, I just wish there was more. Included with the original vinyl release of Because the Internet was a 73 page screenplay sandwiched between its gatefold jacket. This screenplay, now uploaded on the internet for anyone to access, isn't some half-assed throw-in for the limited edition release. It's a significant asset that helps contextualize the greater story being told on Because the Internet and drive home a lot of its themes. Across the screenplay, there's various cues to play each song in the album when certain scenes in the script occur, a formatting that's honestly like kinda neat and begins to clue readers, well I guess listeners too. Clue them in on a larger world Donald is starting to craft here. The screenplay, at first glance, feels a little off when it's just read on its own at least. A bit disjointed, somewhat aimless, almost lacking in purpose despite the immense detail Donald Glover packed in the script regarding each scene and their set details. I always really like this part in the screenplay's opening, where the boy kicks his shoes off every time he gets to his room, and because he always kicks them off in the same spot, there's a pile of shoes underneath a darkened spot on the wall where the shoes get launched every day. Like little stuff like that, where some set piece serves as a visual gag, but also implies some of the key themes in the story, it's something I'm always a sucker for. And on the topic of motifs that go a long way, one of the most prominent ones we see here is something called Roscoe's Wetsuit. So, what is Roscoe's wetsuit? Uh, it, it's Roscoe's wetsuit. Here, let me explain. Early on in the screenplay, the boy sees someone on Twitter randomly refer to a wetsuit that belongs to someone named Roscoe. He googles it, only for the search results to tell him it's just a gag term meant to throw people for a loop that think it's something important. This moment in the story amuses the boy, however brief it is, and it leaves readers wondering, what was the point of that? It's an apparent dead end that seems to be a waste of page space. That is, until we look at the sequence in a more symbolic light. Something that becomes clear when we think of a Chekhov's gun. Great, okay, more pretentious art talk. Who's Chekhov? A Chekhov's gun is a literary guideline that writers are usually encouraged to adhere to regarding seemingly unnecessary or inconsequential details on a scene. Let's say, in chapter 1 of a novel, it's mentioned that there's a rifle hanging above a fireplace. Naturally, readers will keep that gun in the back of their mind, this anticipation of its significance growing as the story toils on without addressing it. Normally, an author would want to avoid describing pointless details of a scene, but the guttural, unimportant nature of Roscoe's wetsuit is precisely what makes it an interesting recurring symbol throughout the BTI universe. My own interpretation of this is that Roscoe's wetsuit is being used as an allegory for our own existence, our presence in the world, both digital and real. All it is, is what it is. There's no greater definition or purpose to it. And yet, you still look for one, didn't you? Roscoe's wetsuit illustrates and reinforces not only this ever-present aura of meaninglessness, but the exploration of said meaninglessness. It's just, but just remember asking your, like, remember asking why, why you want to know, because that's part of it. Why, why do, you, do you know why you want to know? Just, yeah, you just want to know? Yeah, right? Okay, cool. Remember that. Analyzing our own agency, autonomy, and individualism is a key part of Because the Internet's universe, and this screenplay is only the beginning of that long and deep rabbit hole. Entirely separate from Because the Internet's album and screenplay, however, is the short film Clapping for the Wrong Reasons. It's a companion piece that tells a completely different story from Because the Internet's plotline, centered more around the childish Gambino persona than the boy persona. And this isn't to be confused with Because the Internet's music videos, which tell entirely different, more compartmentalized stories, nor should it be confused with the Because the Internet video bumpers, which are the central visual aids for the clever- the- <sighs> Okay, are, are you keeping up here? No? 
Not right, good, because it's about to get even more convoluted. Clapping for the Wrong Reasons was posted on the official Childish Gambino YouTube channel about four months before because the internet was officially announced and released. There's two versions of the film on the Gambino channel, one being an internet version and the other titled Director's Cut. The internet version is just a short, trailer-like supplement to the Phil film. It's very tense, oozing with this dramatic tone. However, if you've seen the actual short film, The Director's Cut, you know that this internet version is absolutely nothing like it tonally. Scenes from the film are spliced together differently and fly at you at this alarming rate, twisting the narrative and perception of clapping for the wrong reasons before you've ever seen it. Kind of like how we receive news and information in the internet age. Yeah, I know the purpose of this internet version is a bit on the nose and not nearly as grand as the rest of the BTI universe, but it's a fun inclusion that pushes audiences to start questioning the tapestry Donald is weaving here. Now, for the real deal. Hello? Hello, who's this? <laughs> Who are you? Sometimes you just can't explain things. Clapping for the wrong reasons, in its sort of prologue nature to Because the Internet, plants the contemplative, lonerous mood that's picked up on by the album and its accompanying work. In its 24 minute runtime, Clapping for the Wrong Reasons gives us a tour of this dreamlike, monotonous, and isolated day in Donald Glover's life, or at least a version of it. His mansion, filled with people he may or may not know or care about, still feels cold, an almost sterile environment. No matter how lavish or expansive this house is, there's no life in these walls. These messy, unkempt walls. Through the myriad of conversations and interactions we see Donald muddle through on this one day, it's tough to pinpoint much purpose to what's going on or why anyone's here. As he's going about his day and working on some music, Donald frequently gets interrupted or sidetracked, primarily for people he doesn't recognize getting his attention and pointing him in a certain direction or towards another group of people. However, nobody else here knows, acknowledges, or recalls looking for Glover. They're just, they're just people here, milling about, floating through and around Donald's reality. You guys sent your girl down there to get me for this? <laughs> I didn't send girl, girl. Like You got a girl here today? Uh-uh. Sweet. No, I didn't bring any girl. I'm, I'm looking for new girls. Do you know her? No. Then why'd you wave? I'm a gentleman. Who are you? Your girl woke me up. Oh. Your girl. I don't have a girl here. Might be Swanks. These anomalies, along with the circular and shallow nature of Glover's interactions with other mansion occupants, as well as the dreamlike aesthetic and color palette brought on from this whole thing being shot on film, helps create this lingering sense of being stuck in some kind of bad dream. This sort of existence within such a surreal space has become a staple in Donald Glover's work, most notably with his TV show Atlanta, which is... Okay, actually, you know what? I'm just gonna stop myself here because if I start talking about Atlanta, we're gonna be here for probably twice as long. The meticulous work and effort done to accentuate the painful monotony of this mansion is done so well in such subtle ways that this one sequence here, for example, it really stood out for me after it clicked. We see this uncomfortably long sequence of Donald getting himself a bowl of cereal in his trashed kitchen, one of the first scenes of the film. At first glance, this scene may seem pretty pointless, like just some filler. But what makes it so special is how its seemingly lazy creation sets up a lot of the central themes of the film. We can't really see Donald make his bowl of cereal. Everything happens outside the frame. And yet, we know exactly what's happening here. A common morning routine for a lot of viewers, something we've grown accustomed to, almost a subconscious habit, something we don't even necessarily comprehend when we're doing it, we just... do. Am I reaching here? Maybe. Probably. But god damn it, it just makes too much sense for this not to be true. I know who want to take me home. Clapping for the wrong reason serves as a perfect appetizer to Because the Internet's album and its other supporting content, giving us a window into the ideas Donald Glover will be playing with across his project, more so focused on himself before he shifted the lens to the more abstract entity of the boy for the album and screenplay. Okay, so that was a lot. Like, a lot. 
There's so much to sift through when it comes to Because the Internet. Just like I was saying earlier, it's a massive project with tons of loose ends and scattered details, all of this being crucial aspects of its various mediums. Throughout its levels and layers of content, Because the Internet's relationship and integration with the Internet itself acts as the catalyst for its own existence, something that makes BTI such a fascinating part of the multimedia art landscape. Now, as inventive of a content ecosystem as Because the Internet is, it's not like it's the first creative effort ever to span across several artistic mediums. The phenomenon of multimedia art has been around for literally decades, with projects like the Velvet Underground's collaborative work with Andy Warhol being one of the first examples of mainstream success. But as we rolled into the 1980s and 90s, we saw more and more ambitious efforts that integrated technological advancements into the way we view and interact with various forms of content. From stuff like Pink Floyd's The Wall, where the accompanying film and stage design for the tour helped carry along the album's story, to the original Watchmen comics, where traditional comic book layouts were merged with other textual structures to create a fuller, more realized universe. The limits for translating artistic expressions across platforms have dissolved over the past half century. Of course, this development was accelerated by this little thing called the internet by the time it reached the 2000s. With the web going from a digital message board where you could talk with strangers and exchange Trojans over LimeWire to a breeding ground for alternative culture and other off-the-wall ideas, the door was wide open for new, fresh, and innovative creative efforts. Because the internet is a project that I really couldn't see coming to fruition without the internet, not just because of the recency of its subject material, but with the wide array of supplemental material to this project and how it's all accessed. It had been tough for Donald to package and distribute an album, screenplay, short film, not to mention promote BTI's accompanying dark web tour and its other odds and ends, in a time when we were still listening to music on Walkmans. So this forward-thinking use of tech was a really refreshing way to do an album rollout. Donald was at a perfect point in his musical career where he could still put out more experimental material, yet his efforts wouldn't fall on deaf ears, as his dedicated fanbase excitedly dissected and discussed each new facet of the Because of the Internet world. But I, I don't want to do albums, especially now if you're going to put out a body of work, it should be like an experience that's like, because we can do, it's easy to do that now. I want to make like worlds and stories that people can live in for like years if they wanted to. Obviously, Gambino wasn't the first person to deliver a new musical project in unique ways using the web. I mean, just look at what Death Grips was doing the years prior. But the combined scale and accessibility of Because the Internet and its accompanying content, as well as the parallel existence of its meanings and mediums, is a fusion that has clearly served as a template for more recent albums and musicians that dip into other media formats. With such a tight relationship between art and technology, however, it opens up a whole new realm of debate and exploration, a topic that has existed for a few years prior. Art about technology and our relationship with it isn't something new. It's something that's been explored across film, music, books. If there's a way for someone to say phone bad, it's probably already been done. But there's this lingering, almost inherent problem that comes with the territory of tech-adjacent commentary. You see, as technology and our relationships with it adapt, keeping up with its changes can be difficult when giving specific insight, commentary, or arguments regarding it. Come off as too broad or generalize things too much, and nobody takes what you're saying seriously. Hyper focus on niche aspects of these phenomena, and what you're saying can fall into obscurity, or even worse, become inconsequential as a technological landscape and society changes. You know, we're living in a society. This sort of balancing act between quality and versatility can really make or break a creative work about technology, where it needs to have a concise and clear intent and message, but still maintain some sense of timelessness. A good example of where this can go wrong comes from an album I listened to last year, Weezer's OK Human. Okay, so if you made it this far and you want to click off the video after I just admitted I voluntarily listened to post-green album Weezer, th there's no shame in that, okay? I'm trying to be a better person, but I don't need your sympathy. Sure, the album sounds nice, with its full orchestral sound, heavy Beach Boys influence, and tight production, but where OK Human lost me was the part when Rivers Cuomo opened his mouth. Sure, there was a decent amount of COVID-related lyrics here, but the other chunk of this album's subject matter, the commentary on technology and our reliance on it, just felt flaccid, like it was all something I'd heard before many, many times before. Everything Rivers talked about in regards to social media and phones and all that other boomer shit was understandable and clear, but the fact that so much of what he was saying just felt vapid, like it lacked any punch, precision, or intent, it just made so many of those themes feel pointless. 
Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, one of my personal favorite TV programs was the 1998 avant-garde anime, Serial Experiments Lane, a short series that I'm happy to see is re-emerging a bit in the internet culture zeitgeist. It's a bit, uh, artsy, I guess that's one way to put it. Its disturbing imagery and kind of batshit insane plot create this fascinating, abstract, and bone-chilling tapestry of a world reliant on technology and its implications on humanity. Considering that the series came out long before internet culture had plowed its way into the mainstream, it's kind of fascinating how this weird ass show is aged and held up thematically alongside the development of our own society. The non-linear story and the psychological questions it poses are right up my alley. But this is where we get into the other problem. Serial Experiments Lame passes my vibe check. It knows what it wants to be, what it wants to say, and says it in its own unique, fascinating way. But that doesn't mean it'll just stick the landing for everyone. Lane is far from an easy watch, with its off-the-wall structure and unsettling themes being a pretty understandable turnoff for people. Combine that with the relative obscurity of this show, it's not exactly something I'd recommend to someone on a first date. It has the opposite dilemma that OK Human has. It's got an engaging, valuable, and well-refined message, but it falls apart in translation, being just a bit too abrasive and artsy for larger audiences. Given these two extremes of final products, trying to walk this tightrope can be a serious pitfall for creatives. It's a task that can be too much for many artists, but if handled correctly, can lead to whatever their work is cementing itself in history, which is exactly what happened with Radiohead's OK Computer. You know who Radiohead is, I know who Radiohead is, let's just skip the formalities and get right into it. OK Computer is an undisputed classic record that's become a quintessential component of 90s art rock and the Radiohead discography. Across its melancholic, atmospheric soundscape, Radiohead delves into the grasp of existentialism and loneliness within turn-of-the-century society, contemplating our purpose and importance in a world they believe is being ruined by corrupt politicians, isolation, and the consumption of society by technology. It was a cutting-edge record that not only pushed boundaries at the time, but has remained a fascinating statement on our future as a species, helped tremendously by the surgical precision of its delivery. These kinds of qualities that make OK Computer so special are honestly exactly what I see in Because of the Internet, such a precise, confidently different project. Its place as an interactive, layered, and deep snapshot of early 2010s internet and our culture is something we didn't really see anything else like, and probably won't see anything else comparable to it soon. In the years that have followed, the influence that BTI has had on album rollouts and crafting the layers of their existence has become apparent with the growing freedom and creativity for art being flipped on its head throughout the internet age. Calling an album like this a classic, not even 10 years since it dropped, is pretty high praise, but with the compounding significance and influence of this musical solar system that Donald created here, I don't see why I shouldn't see it as such. Because the internet as a whole was just so ahead of the curve, from its music to its rollout, it'd be tough to really recapture its energy and make a similar sort of project today with the substantive as a meaning. Tackling such a fluid, ambiguous subject like existentialism almost requires the same sort of open-ended mentality and approach. And through all of BTI's quirks and odd extensions in the universe, from the album to the screenplay and film, even its tour, accompanying websites, burner social media accounts, and just so much more, Donald captured this intangible, easily escapable thesis for a brief yet impactful moment. It was something that manifested in the right place at the right time, this synchronization of metamorphosing artists in a changing social landscape leading to a one-of-a-kind creation. It's been over 8 years since BTI released. Hell, depending on when this video comes out, it might be closer to 9. Since then, Donald's career and his childish Gambino persona have undergone a lot of changes, as his film, television, and musical styles have adapted to his growing mainstream recognition. For someone as multi-talented as Glover, who's to say what his future endeavors are going to hold? But for as wide a possibility as Donald has right now, I have a feeling that because the internet will always have a pretty significant space within his catalog. For being born out of a time of so much internal reflection on his part, and for tackling such abstract yet personal subjects, I can't think of any good reason why this shouldn't be considered Donald's best work to date. Childish Gambino's sprawling, enigmatic approach to deciphering his existential questions was fighting an uphill battle from the get-go. Like I said, it's tough to put a response towards such an evolving, subconscious phenomenon into words. But maybe it never had to be said, just felt, telegraphed to the audience, a clue towards a bigger, more amorphous idea and provocations. Maybe there is something to say about our agency, our humanity, our purpose, or lack thereof in our connected world. Maybe it's all because of the internet. Ah, 
You again? Does anyone here ever lock the door? Jess, where have you been? You just, like, disappeared with no warning. Is everything alright? Oh yeah, everything's fine. I just had to get back in touch with some old friends and associates. All that boring business stuff. I've been hanging with you guys for a while now, so it was about time I started working on those connections, I promised. Okay, I know you mentioned that sort of thing a while ago, but I mostly just- Dude, I told you this when we met. Networking is crucial, and it just so happens to be one of the countless things I'm great at. And not only that, when I was out and about, I happened to snag three of these. Um, alright, what are these? These things are passes to what's going to be one of the biggest parties in LA in years. We're all invited, and we've got a chance to meet some of the most important and influential people in town. Getting an invite for this thing was impossible, let alone three of them. You guys can thank me later, preferably through Cash App. A party? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's cool, but... Cool? Dude, this is great news! You realize how huge this could be for your career? Hold on, so you're getting us into this party, but what's in it for you? There's gotta be a catch here. For me? Nothing, really. This is about you guys. Getting these kinds of connections is why I'm here. Granted, I'll be doing some networking on my own, but, but that's not what's important here. Jess, are you sure about this? I don't know what it is, but I got a bad feeling about this. I've never been more sure about something in my entire life. I get that you're a little uneasy about this thing or whatever, but you've got nothing to worry about. In the end, you'll probably thank me.